to Gwinnett County Public Library. Thank you for joining our Native American Heritage Month program. My name is Amy Perry, and I'm an adult services specialist with the library. We are excited to have professor and author Lionel Laure with us. Laure is the president of Bordeaux Montage University in France and a Native American scholar. He is the author of several books and the editor of Unconquerable, the story of John Ross. Please welcome Professor Laure. Hello. Thank you for welcoming uh, here. Uh, thank you, uh, Amy, for, for inviting me to, to talk to, uh, to uh, your, uh, your patrons today about uh, uh, John Milton Oskison and more particularly um, about uh, his new book that I've uh, helped uh, publish, uh, which is Unconquerable, a biography of John Ross. Um, I will start uh, presenting myself in a few words uh, to simply for, for you to, to know where I'm from and, uh, and uh, where I'm speaking from, uh, in a way. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm Lionel Larré. I'm, I'm a professor at uh, Un Bordeaux Montaigne University in Bordeaux, France. And uh, as, uh, as a professor, I'm also a researcher. Uh, I and I do my research on Native American uh, in Native American studies, and uh, for a few years now I've focused my attention on uh, the Cherokee Nation, and uh, particularly uh, the way I um, uh, tackle uh, these subjects uh, is through how Native Americans are represented. Uh, and uh, uh, notably how they represent themselves. Um, I did my uh, PhD dissertation uh, on Native American autobiographies, and uh, uh, that was 20 years ago. And the idea for me was to, uh, the idea to do such a, 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 a doctoral research uh, was, uh, came from a curiosity I had uh, for how Native Americans represented themselves. Um, and I had this, I was curious about that because like most people, the only representations I had of Native Americans, especially in Europe, but it's true also, unfortunately, of, uh, of the US, uh, the, the, most of the representations I had of Native Americans were produced by non-Native Americans. And of course, uh, I think mainly of, of literature and, and of cinema. And for years, Hollywood have shown us Native Americans uh, without Native Americans having really a say-so in how they were, they were represented. And so 20 years ago, when I, when I was a student, I was curious about, about um, how Native Americans represent themselves. And so I... Um, I, um, so that's how I, I, I do my work. I, I, I work not uh, necessarily uh, on the history of Native Americans, not only on uh, the literature of Native Americans, but on uh, Native American representations of themselves. Um, and my link to John Milton Oskarsson, I will tell you uh, about how I, I encountered uh, this Cherokee author. Uh, but today I'm here not as the author of Unconquerable, but as the editor, uh, as the guy who found uh, a manuscript, an unpublished manuscript of this biography of John Ross by John Oskison, and as the guy who uh, asked a publisher here at the University of Nebraska Press uh, about the possibility of having this biography uh, published because I saw an interest in uh, having this book written in the 1930s published today. And I will also explain uh, why in, uh, in a few minutes. Uh, before uh, this uh, book, I published a few uh, books in my field of research in French for a, a French audience. Uh, you have here the two covers of uh, of two main books I've I've uh, I've done uh, 
uh, in French. In 2009, I published a book on Native American autobiography based on my uh, doctoral students. Uh, sorry, my doctoral uh, research. It's called Autobiographie Amérindienne. Pouvoir et résistance de l'écriture de soi is the subtitle, which means power and resistance in self-writing. Uh, and uh, in 2012, I published A History of the Cherokee Nation, uh, which um, is a topic I also taught for my uh, students uh, at, a bachelor, at a bachelor's degree at, in my university. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it, it's a very popular topic among students uh, because, as I said before, uh, talking about uh, Hollywood representations of Native Americans, popular culture representations of Native Americans, uh, the students in France and in other places, uh, that's basically all they know about Native Americans if they are not curious enough to go beyond these representations. And so when I taught them a class on the history of the Cherokee Nation, they were very interested because it uh, questioned all the cliches they had in mind. Uh, it deconstructed uh, everything they thought they knew about Native Americans and about the Cherokees in particular. And so um, uh, it's... Uh, That's why I thought it was very important to, to, I think it's very important to teach about Native American history uh, here in France, but, but really everywhere. So those are, are, are two books I, I published uh, before um, my, uh, I started working on, on John Milton Oskison, even though in fact I, uh, I actually um, came across Oskison uh, during my doctoral research. Uh, on Native American autobiography, which led to this book here on the, on, on the left. I will come to that. Uh, the main point today, of course, the main subject today is John Milton Oskison and his work. So a few words about, about him. Uh, Oskison uh, was a Cherokee author. He was born in 1874 uh, in Indian Territory, Okay, so in the state of Oklahoma, before it was the state of Oklahoma. Um, you probably know, I assume you know about uh, uh, the history of, uh, of, Indian, of Indian territory. Uh, briefly, just in case uh, you, uh, uh, you forgot, Indian territory uh, is what is now the state of Oklahoma uh, and was created uh, at the beginning of the 19th century in the 1830s. Uh, in the context of the removal policy, that is to say the, the policy uh, implemented by President Andrew Jackson to remove uh, the Native American nations of the Southeast, uh, notably Georgia, um, to remove these nations west of the Mississippi in order to make room for uh, uh, settlements, for, 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 America, for US settlements. Um, so he was born there. He was born in, in Indian Territory in the Cherokee Nation in 1874. Uh, he grew up in a, on a farm. His father was English. His mother was a Cherokee citizen. Uh, his mother died uh, very when he was very young. He was four when his mother died. But uh, his father uh, stayed in Indian Territory in the Cherokee Nation. He was a a Cherokee citizen by, by marriage. They had a farm and uh, Oskison grew up um, um, on the farm, uh, herding cattle, basically. Um, he tells about his childhood uh, in a, an autobiography, which is in the first volume I published of Oskison's writings. Um, The Tales of the Old Indian Territory and Essays on the Indian Condition. Uh, when I did my research on Native American autobiography, when I was a doctoral student, uh, I went into the archives of uh, the, the Western History Collection at the University of Oklahoma. And that's where I first encountered an unpublished manuscript 
the manuscript of Oskisson's autobiography, which he had not finished. He had uh, written it in the 1940s, that is to say a few years before he died. Oskisson died in 1947. And so he never finished his autobiography and he, of course, never published it. Um, when I found that uh, manuscript, I was working on my own um, uh, PhD dissertation, so I didn't have much time to, um, to deal with it, uh, but, I, but I read it. I took the time to read it in the, in the library of the Western History Collections at, at, in Norman, Oklahoma. And I found it very interesting, notably because it was telling me uh, about uh, a Native American childhood that I was not used to. The other autobiographies I worked on were by, uh, at the same time period, were, for example, by Charles Alexander Eastman uh, and others. And Charles Alexander Eastman, for example, tells of a childhood in his autobiography called Indian Boyhood, um, a very traditional Sioux Lakota childhood. And of course, uh, Oskison's childhood was very different. So it was an interesting read. And I thought it's a pity that um, uh, this autobiography is not available for everybody to, to read. But I left it there. I talked to, um, uh, I had met uh, a, um, uh, a professor at the University of Oklahoma uh, who, who is a Creek and a Cherokee. And uh, he, he had welcomed me uh, in, in his class. Uh, his name is Craig Womack. He's a pretty well-known uh, scholar in Native American studies in the US and in the world, actually. Um, and I told him about this autobiography and I, and I said to him, uh, you know, uh, you should check it out. It's uh, really interesting. 10 years later, I met uh, Craig again and uh, I asked him uh, if uh, he had uh, um, news about someone uh, working with this unpublished uh, autobiography of Oskison, if uh, he knew of a project to have it published. And, uh, and uh, he, he, he himself uh, uh, didn't have time to take care of it and he didn't know uh, of anyone uh, who did. And so also encouraged by other scholars, I decided to have it published and to, to do then a, a, a work of editing his autobiography. And when I came with this project uh, to uh, the University Press of Nebraska, uh, Oskison was not known at the time. Uh, he was uh, known uh, by a few uh, uh, scholars, but really his writings were not easily available. And so the University of Nebraska Press encouraged me to actually edit a volume of his writings including the autobiography, but also uh, many other texts uh, which uh, were not easily available because they were published in magazines of the beginning of the 20th century. And those magazines, of course, were only in uh, archives in some uh, uh, libraries now and there on, in the US, but not available for, for, for most readers. And so that's how I... Uh, I uh, um, edited and uh, wrote an introduction uh, to the tales of the old Indian territory and essays on the Indian condition. Uh, I'll get back to what uh, this, um, this book contains, but first going back to, uh, to Oskison's life in a few words, he grew up on a farm. Uh, that's a story he tells in uh, uh, as I said in his autobiography, uh, and also he wrote uh, his childhood on the farm in the Indian Territory inspired him a lot of his write a lot of his fiction writing. Uh, he wrote a few novels that I will uh, show you later. He wrote uh, many short stories uh, that are included in this book, uh, Tales of the Old Indian Territory. And I would like to show you now a quote, a passage from his autobiography, um, which uh, tells us about how he got the idea, basically, of writing about Indian territory. So this is what he wrote in, uh, in his autobiography 
uh, entitled A Tale of the Old IT, IT for Indian Territory. On those day-long rides, especially in the afternoons when hunger stimulated the imagination, I began recalling some of the characters in the fiction I had read and the sort of detail used by the writers I liked best. Gradually, it dawned on me that many of the characters in my favorite stories were remarkably like real people. From that thought, I progressed to another. Why wouldn't the folks of our neighborhood make interesting characters in stories? Why couldn't such scenes and incidents as fast-running prairie fires, roundups, night rides of quietly gathered posses to nab cattle thieves, spectacular fights between deputy United States marshals and train robbers, the violent rebellion against father's hard discipline of brother will be used in stories. And the next, the, the next passage is, suppose I were able to write these stories. I might make a book of them and call it Tales of the Old IT. I would let the world know about Indian territory. Much later, some of the tales were written and published in good magazines, but I never collected them into a book. My title, which I still think is a good one, has never been used. And so basically what I did uh, with the publication, the editing uh, of, uh, of um, Tales of the Old, Old Indian Territory, I like to think that it's basically what Oskison would have liked to do, but didn't have time to do. That is to say a collection of texts, uh, autobiographical and uh, short fiction, a collection of texts telling about his old IT, this Indian territory that he loved to uh, grow up in, basically. Um, and that's one of the interests of reading Oskison today. I will get back to that also. Uh, he's one of the few authors coming from Indian territory. There are many authors coming from Oklahoma, of course, but there are a few authors who were alive during the Indian territory period and who wrote about it and uh, uh, those writings are a very useful insight, very interesting insight on what was life like uh, in Indian Territory at the time. Oskison then was an author of uh, short stories, of fiction, uh, but he was also a journalist when he left Indian Territory, uh, actually. So he, he, he first he studied in Stanford. He was the first Native American student at Stanford University. He also, that was at the end of the 19th century. He also studied one year at Harvard. And then he went to New York in, the, in 1900 to become a journalist. And he had a long career as a journalist in different uh, uh, newspapers and, and magazines. Um, and he was uh, a journalist in the financial uh, section of the, of the New York Post, for example. And so he wrote many, many articles on, uh, on finances. During the First World War, he also wrote a few articles about uh, what was happening uh, um, during the war in Europe. Uh, so that's the work he did as a journalist. But he also was, that's basically his third uh, role. So first a fiction writer, first a journalist, I should say, then a fiction writer. And then he was an activist. He was a Native American activist. Uh, he was a founding member of, uh, in 1911, of the Society of American Indians. That was a group, an organization of Native American intellectuals, um, a group uh, which promoted um, Native American rights, basically. And that's a very interesting part uh, of uh, Oskison's life. And it's actually also a very interesting period, historical period in the long history of Native American resistance uh, to study because this period and the, the numerous Native American intellectuals of the time are remained for a long time, not very well known, kind of neglected by uh, uh, people who were interested in uh, Native American literature and, uh, and uh, and uh, history. Neglected because uh, first, the texts of those people were not easily accessible, as I said earlier uh, about Oskison's texts. 
but also um, historically in the US, the beginning of the 20th century is a difficult time for Native Americans. There were other difficult times before, of course, but it was the time of the assimilation policy. Uh, the idea of the federal government was to assimilate uh, Native Americans. Um, it was a time when Native American nations' sovereignty was um, uh, curbed very strongly. Uh, tribal governments were uh, abolished in uh, 1906, if I remember properly. Uh, uh, and so um, it was very hard for Native Americans to basically defend, uh, 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 to keep defending uh, their sovereignty, uh, their rights. Of course, uh, the armed resistance of the 19th century was over. Uh, now they, they had to find other ways to, to resist and uh, um, to resist assimilation, uh, but also to find a way to be part of US society. And that's what basically these Native American intellectuals tried to do in uh, their organizations, like uh, the Society of American Indians, and also in their writings. And John Milton Oskison was one of these uh, authors, to name a few others, uh, there was Charles Alexander Eastman that I mentioned already. There was uh, Zid Kalasha, also known as Gertrude Bonin, a very, very interesting uh, Lakota uh, a woman um, uh, activist, um, and uh, Carlos Montezuma, and, and so many others. So Oskison was one of those um, was one of those people. Uh, so he had as a whole as a fiction writer, as a journalist, as, a, as a, an activist uh, writer, uh, he was a very prolific author. Um, the, the book, Tales of the Old Indian Territory, gathers about uh, 40 uh, different texts, I think. Uh, I'm looking, yeah, no, I, I'm not gonna count them and waste time, but it, it's about that, between 40 and 50 uh, texts. Uh, Half of them are short stories. The other half are essays, uh, activist writings. Uh, it's a, it's a 700 page uh, book. Uh, it's, it, it's a lot and everything is not in there. So th there's still a lot to discover uh, uh, about uh, uh, Oskison's writings. As I said, he wrote uh, uh, many, uh, as a fiction writer, he, he wrote mainly uh, short stories, but he also wrote a few novels. I listed them uh, here. Wild Harvest, a novel of transition days in Oklahoma, 1925. Uh, Black Jack Davy, 1926. Brothers Three, 1935. And there was an unpublished novel that... Uh, uh, scholars uh, discovered uh, a few years ago, 20 years ago, The Singing Bird, and they, uh, they had it published, uh, a bit like uh, what I did uh, for uh, his, uh, his, other, his other writings. So those are the novels. Uh, he also wrote three biographies, one of Sam Houston, a Texas Titan. Uh, Sam Houston, who was, uh, of course, the founder of... Uh, of uh, Texas, but also a, 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 um, a, a man who was adopted by the Cherokee Nation. Uh, Tecumseh and his times, about the, um, the, um, the leader uh, uh, of a pan-Indian, pan-Native American movement at the beginning of the 19th century. And, uh, of course, Unconquerable, the biography of, of John Ross, uh, which uh, I uh, am publishing uh, today. So that leads me to the question, uh, why publish his book today, uh, knowing that um, uh, Unconquerable was written in the 1930s, uh, was submitted to a publisher, and was refused by that publisher. Um, of, so of course, uh, this requires an explanation. Uh, why? Uh, is it useful to, to read uh, uh, this book in particular uh, today and Oskison in general? Uh, as I said uh, before, Oskison uh, was neglect neglected uh, for a long time. Um, and 
I said that it was because his texts were not easily available, which is true. Uh, but also, uh, when Oskison is mentioned briefly uh, in uh, works by Native American scholars or scholars in Native American studies in the 1970s and 1980s, that is, that is to say when the field of Native American studies emerged and developed uh, in American universities, when he's mentioned, um, he's, he's quickly dismissed as being an assimilationist. That is to say, a Native American who believed that indeed Native Americans should be assimilated uh, uh, by a US society. When Native American studies emerged as a field uh, and when Native American literature emerged also, uh, no, I shouldn't say emerged, but, but really became well known uh, after uh, the Pulitzer Prize of uh, Anne Scott Momaday in 1968 with a novel called House Made of Dawn, this launched a movement of uh, a kind of, not a fashion because that would be uh, uh, a derogatory, but uh, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, a lot of interest for Native American literature and Native American history emerged. And uh, the field of Native American studies uh, was created and was developed in, in some American universities. So that was in the 1970s, that is to say, at the same time as a civil rights movement, as the Native American civil rights movement. So at the time, uh, it was very important for scholars in Native American studies to show how uh, the literary production uh, of Native Americans uh, was a way to resist, a, a, a weapon of resistance against colonization. And at first sight, that was not what uh, John Milton Oskison seemed to do. And that's why he was quickly dismissed as an, assimilation, as, as an, uh, uh, an assimilationist. And, and that's where I, I disagree, basically, in calling him an assimilationist. Uh, in fact, uh, Oskison's characters in his short stories uh, and in his novels are Native Americans who not only are well adapted to US society, but they also contribute to it. But it's not because they are well adapted to US society and it's not because they contribute to US society that they are assimilated. What he shows is characters who contribute as Native Americans. Uh, he, he shows people who first are capable of adapting and contributing and that was uh, uh, no small task to drive this message through because at the time, the idea was that Native Americans uh, were not capable of adjusting, basically, uh, that the Native Americans were vanishing, you know, probably the, 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 the myth of the vanishing American at the end of the 19th century. And so he had to show him and others of, this, of the same period, had to show that uh, not only they were capable of contributing, but they were also, um, they had something good and useful to contribute to, to US society. Uh, and that's, that's what Oskison does. And I want to show you a, a, a last quote by him, a last excerpt, uh, which sums up how Oskison wanted to represent uh, Native Americans. And that's from a, an essay entitled The Indian in the Professions. My business or profession is writing and editing. In my small way, I've tried to make myself an interpreter to the world of the modern progressive Indian. The greatest handicap I have is my enthusiasm. I know a lot of Indians who are making good. I know how sturdily they have set their faces toward the top of the hill and how they've tramped on when the temptation to step aside and rest was strongest. When I try to write about them, I lose my critical sense. Then the editor sympathize. Too bad he's got that Indian bug. And ask me about the cowboys. Now, I write fiction about cowboys. Make them yip yip and shoot their 44s till everybody's death. But I will not repeat the old lies about the Indian for any editor that ever paid on acceptance. 
that to me is a very the very important message that Oskison uh, wants to um, wants to, um, to to communicate. He doesn't want to repeat the old lies about the Indians. That is to say, the cliches, uh, the the uh, the lie of the vanishing American, uh, the lie that Native Americans belong to the past and have disappeared now, and they're incapable of being modern, of adjusting, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so. To me, uh, this kind of representations proposing in the context that Oskison was in, and still today actually, proposing such representations was an act of resistance, an act of resistance against the definitions that other people uh, gave of who the Native Americans were. That's why I think Oskison is very important to, uh, to read uh, today, to rediscover today, through his short stories, his fiction, or through the um, uh, biography of John Ross. Um, I have to say a few words maybe about this specific book and about, about who John Ross uh, was, and also about what this book, this biography was for Oskison, uh, and what to me, um, uh, it, uh, it, it represents this book in the, in the work of Oskison. Um, writing the biography of John Ross in the 1930s is an act of, uh, of uh, defense of the, of, the, of the sovereignty of the Cherokee nation. Um, if I, we understand sovereignty as uh, a, a mix of a political sovereignty, but also cultural sovereignty, historical sovereignty, that is to say the power that a people have to uh, write their own history, to define their own culture, to produce their own literature, that is to say to produce their own representations of themselves. Um, in an introduction to another biography that Oskison wrote, the biography of Tecumseh, he wrote, this book is dedicated to all dreamers and strivers for the integrity of the Indian race, some of whose blood flows in my veins. Um, also, although uh, Oskison was born of an English father and uh, a, a Cherokee mother, uh, he, he clearly defined himself as a Cherokee as a Native American, and as this dedication uh, uh, indicates, it was very important to him to defend what he calls the integrity of the Indian race. What does he mean by integrity? I think he means some form of sovereignty. That is to say, uh, the possibility of uh, a Native American people to, uh, uh, to be, um, not to be destroyed, basically, uh, physically, but also uh, politically. And when he writes the biography of John Ross, that's what he does, basically. He, he contributes to the integrity of the Cherokee nation to building uh, a Cherokee nationhood. Why? Because John Ross is probably uh, one of the most important figures in Cherokee history. Who was John Ross? He was a uh, chief of the Cherokees as uh, the cover of the book uh, indicates between 1828 and 1866, that is to say, until he dies, until he died. Uh, if you pay attention to those dates, John Ross was chief principal of the, of the, the Cherokees during probably uh, some of the harshest times for in, in Cherokee history. 1830 is the Removal Act implemented by... Uh, passed by Congress and uh, uh, enacted by uh, um, uh, President Andrew Jackson. In the, in the wake of this removal act, the, the, the federal government signed removal treaties with different nations, which then moved the west of the Mississippi to Indian territory. The Cherokee nation resisted this move. The Cherokee nation in the 1830s are very well integrated into the uh, US uh, economy. 
uh, they have plantations, the Cherokees, a lot of them at the time. Uh, so they are part of the cotton economy, for example. They also have cattle. Uh, they, they basically live almost like their, uh, their uh, Euro-American uh, neighbors. So they really see no point of moving. They, they, they don't have to move to preserve some kind of traditional way of life. Um, and so they resist. And a lot of pressure is exerted by uh, the federal government and uh, by the state of Georgia and the other states where the Cherokee territory uh, was. A lot of pressure is exerted to force them to accept to move. Uh, finally, a faction of uh, a, a group of Cherokee citizens will accept to sign a treaty, the famous Treaty of New Echota. Uh, John Ross and most of the Cherokee nation resisted this move until uh, they were forced by the Treaty of New Echota and they were removed on what you know, of course, probably as the Trail of Tears in the winter of 1838 and 1839. Uh, a forced removal, uh, which killed 4,000 people, uh, Cherokees. And then they were in the West, in Indian territory. Uh, they had to reconstruct uh, the nation. Uh, then the civil war um, breaks out. During the civil war, very hard time for the Cherokees also. I will give you a few details. And then uh, in 1966, the end of the Civil War and also uh, the, the death of, of, John, of John, uh, John Ross. But basically John Ross was the leader of the Cherokees throughout this period, uh, which of course is a very significant historical period for the Cherokee, uh, for the Cherokee nation. Uh, so Oscar Sun, when he writes the biography of John Ross, he writes also about this history of the Cherokee nation because you cannot write the biography of John Ross without really telling uh, the, the story of what the Cherokees as a whole, the Cherokee nation as a whole, had to go through uh, in the 19th century. And so some of what uh, Oskison tells is this uh, history of, of factional, factionalism in the Cherokee nation, uh, which maybe I'm going to say a few words about to, 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 to make sure that uh, things are clear for everybody. As I said, the beginning of the 1830s, a lot of pressure on the Cherokee nation for them to move. Most Cherokee resist, but a few of them uh, yield to pressure, uh, very understandably, uh, and form a, um, uh, a party favorable to uh, the removal. This party was led by Ma Major Rich, and so uh, two parties, two political parties in the Cherokee nation appeared at the time, hence the factionalism. Before that, it was not really the case. It was pretty united. Uh, John Ross forming the Ross party uh, against removal and uh, Major Ridge, the Ridge party or the treaty party, that is the party favorable to signing a treaty of removal. Uh, there's a divide in 1835, uh, the treaty party without the authorization of the official government of the Cherokee nation signed the Treaty of New Echota and the removal uh, happened, the trade of tears, etc., etc. what I've just uh, said, uh, what I've just talked about. After the removal, when John Ross and the rest of the nation uh, are forcefully uh, moved west. The reconstruction of the Cherokee Nation is difficult, of course, because there are two uh, very divided groups. Uh, there are some assassinations going on uh, on, uh, on each side. Uh, for example, three major leaders of the Treaty Party are assassinated in 1839, that is to say after the, the whole Cherokee Nation is removed. Uh, Elias Boudino, uh, John Ridge and Major Ridge. And uh, uh, for a long time, John Ross was accused of um, having ordered these murders, these assassinations, these executions. Um, and that leads me to uh, the last uh, point I want to, uh, to talk about. Um, 
it leads me to to why maybe uh, the biography of John Ross was not published when it was written in the 1930s. Uh, my take, of course, in, in my introduction to the book, I explain why I think so. Uh, my take is that um, uh, John Ross in the 1930s was still a very controversial figure in Oklahoma and in the Cherokee Nation. Um, it was controversial because of this factionalism, which, although it was created in the 1830s, continued throughout the 19th century and left trace, traces in, at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, during the Civil War, for example, uh, this factionalism, this division between the nation, reappeared very, uh, very strongly uh, with the figure of Stan Wati. Stan Wati was the cousin of John Rich. Uh, and uh, during the Civil War, when John Ross chose neutrality in the war. He, he didn't want the Cherokee Nation to be involved. Stan Wati, on the contrary, joined the South. He was a secessionist. And Stan Wati was actually the last Confederate general to, um, to um, how do you say that, to, um, uh, to stop the, to, to, um, to, render, uh, to, to render arms. I think that's how you say it, to, at the end of the war, the, the, the last general to uh, to give up, okay, and to um, and to uh, uh, accept the end of the war. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm forgetting my, my word here. Um, to surrender, that's what I was looking for. Uh, these divisions then uh, were um, had left traces, as I said, and 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 John Ross really was still very controversial. Uh, still, many people believe that he. He was. Uh, he had ordered some assassinations. That he uh, um, he was not completely. Um, yeah, he was not completely completely okay as a as a, as a character. And of course, other people uh, believe that he was uh, uh, the the a great leader, uh, uh, elected and re-elected many many times, and who uh, helped uh, lead uh, the Cherokee Nation into resistance. That's one thing, one reason I think why this book was not published at the time. Of course, there are other reasons. Um, this book is a, a book for a general audience. It's, a, it's an easy read, this biography of John Ross. Uh, but Oskison submitted it to a, a university press. He, he submitted it to the University Press of Oklahoma. And so the reviewers of the manuscript, the people who, who evaluated the manuscript to a uh, to tell the press whether uh, it should be published or not, um, found it problematic uh, because they uh, uh, they thought that uh, scientifically uh, the biography was not uh, uh, without its flaws. And it is true that uh, some passages uh, do not uh, rely on on uh, uh, as uh, as research should on. Uh, concrete proofs of what uh, happened. Um, however, John Oskison, as uh, he indicates in the story, or in, the, in, the subtitle, in the subtitle of the, of the book, uh, tells a story of John Ross. He doesn't tell a history, okay? So he doesn't claim to be completely uh, uh, scientifically, uh, he, he doesn't claim that this is a scholarly work, okay? Uh, he, he really wants to publish a story like uh, uh, like the other uh, uh, fiction he, he, he published. But, but for the reviewers of the University Press of uh, Oklahoma, that was a problem. Today, a lot of research, of course, has been uh, uh, made on John Ross. And I can tell you that the story that John Oskison tells uh, of John Ross in the book is accurate. Okay, Today, we know it is because uh, the papers of John Ross are known. We have his, his correspondence. We have his, his speeches. Uh, and so it is easy now to show what is uh, correct and what is not. Uh, there are a few um, uh, uh, approximations in the, in the quotes of John Ross that Oskison gives in the book. Uh, but that's, when, that's where my work as an editor uh, is uh, useful uh, in, in EndNotes. I, I write, okay, here, Oskison uh, forgets uh, 
uh, part of the quote or uh, gives the, the wrong quote and, and I give the, 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 the good one. But it doesn't happen very often. And on the whole, of course, uh, the story he tells is, is an accurate one and, and is a story that is uh, uh, well accepted by, by most uh, scholars of the, of the Cherokee Nation. Um, and that, that's the, the second reason why I think this book is worth uh, reading now, it, it is interesting to read now. Um, it is one of the few books uh, easily available to a, a general audience uh, telling the story of John Ross. And as I said, John Ross is a, is a, is a key figure of the Cherokee Nation, he's a very important uh, uh, character. And I say a key figure in the, in the history of the Cherokee Nation, but also a key figure in uh, the US history of the 19th century. Because basically, uh, the, the, the conflict there was between the federal government and the Cherokee Nation in the 1830s uh, defined a great part of uh, the US history of the 19th century. And in fact, uh, the Civil War uh, broke out over the question of slavery in the 1860s, uh, it could have broke out uh, over the, the, the question of the Cherokees and the other uh, Native American nations that were removed over the question of removal uh, in the 1830s. During that time period, the country, uh, the whole country was very divided over the question of removal. Uh, removal actually in Congress was passed by a very, very narrow margin of, uh, of um, members of Congress. And so it was a very tense uh, period for, 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 the, for the, U the United States at the time. And uh, rereading, rediscovering this story today uh, through uh, the biography of John Ross is, uh, is actually very, very useful. It resonates a lot with, uh, uh, well, with, uh, with, with many, many things. It's a way to, uh, to revisit, uh, to re revisit the, 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 the history of the US in the 19th century. I'm, uh, I've been uh, maybe too long already. Um, that's uh, that's what I could tell you uh, about uh, about Oscar. Um, no, I could tell you much more about Oskarson and about his work, uh, obviously. But I don't want to uh, to bore you too much. And uh, and uh, maybe there are questions that I, I can I can answer to uh, uh, to clarify a few points. Great. Thank you so much, Professor Larry, for sharing your knowledge and expertise on this topic. Um, I did have a question or two. Um, while you were doing this research, what were some of your, what were some of the difficulties and challenges to editing um, these books by John Milton Okasen? So first, of course, once you locate the, the manuscript, um, uh, the first uh, work to do is retype everything. Uh, because of course uh, you have to submit to the to to uh, to the press uh, a, a document that is uh, well uh, organized and uh, according to the guidelines, etc. That is a uh, tedious work in a way, but it's not difficult uh, per se. It's it just take, takes a long time. Uh, of course, you have to be difficult to uh, you have to be very careful not to um, uh, not to. Uh, to make uh, typing mistakes because you don't want to, to, to betray the original manuscript. And then um, that was true mainly on the first volume on, on, uh, for, for Tales of the Indian, uh, the Indian uh, Tales of the Old Indian Territory, more uh, than for Unconquerable. Uh, I had to research every historical fact to uh, make sure that they were accurate. Uh, and sometimes to simply understand what he was talking about. Uh, so for Unconquerable, I had worked many years in Cherokee history. So that was not so much of a problem. I just had a few historical facts to, to, to check. But for the first volume, uh, as I said, before I published the first volume of, of his writings, Oskison uh, Os was not known. He was not accessible. His writings were not accessible. So... The first difficulty, of course, was to locate all the documents. It's a difficulty, but at the, at the same time, it was made uh, quite easy by the fact that many university libraries, many archives in the US uh, digitalize their resources. And so even during my research from France, I came a few times, 
I, I went a few times to the US, of course, to, 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 to do the work, but I could also work from home uh, in France because many of the documents were uh, digitalized. So that was uh, the first task, locating the text that could be made. But then once I had located the text, in order to contextualize for the reader who doesn't know Oskison, contextualize his writings, I had to check every histori historical fact, basically, to uh, either make sure they were correct, or if they were not, to uh, uh, correct them in my end notes. Uh, for the fiction, uh, I had to also ex give a few explanations, because Oskison wrote for an audience of his time, a contemporary audience, and so obviously they knew what he was talking about. Today, when you read a short story uh, about Indian territory, uh, you don't necessarily always know what he's talking about. And so I had uh, to write a, 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 a footnote to explain a few things. And of course, to explain it, I had to research it because sometimes I myself didn't even know what he was talking about. So it was hard work. I mean, it was hard work. It was long work, but it was also very fascinating and interesting because that's basically doing, it's basically doing this work that I got so interested in Cherokee history. Uh, and during that research, actually, I could gather enough uh, information to write my French book on the, on the history of the Cherokee Nation. It's after I did the, that work uh, on Oskison's writings that I could write uh, a, a history of the Cherokee Nation. So difficult and long, but very interesting and fascinating. Yes, we can tell that you're very enthusiastic about it. And um, it's, it's very interesting to me um, here as an American. We study about the indigenous people and, uh, you know, each of the tribes, particularly here in Georgia. We do have a Georgia history as part of mm -hmm. our curriculum um, in elementary school. But we I don't know that um, our children are always exposed, children and adults, um, being exposed to short stories or novels or other pieces of writings by Native Americans. That is very, in this part, I think is very uncommon um, to have it. So I'm, I'm very interested um, in knowing, did you come across any female writers um, of, of Native Americans that um, perhaps have kind of been hidden away or just not published um, into the public? Absolutely. I mentioned among the activists that I was talking about um, uh, from the beginning of the, the 20th century, uh, I mentioned one, uh, Gertrude Bonin, uh, Zit Kalasha was the, uh, her, her, her chosen name. Uh, and she was uh, recently also made available to, to, to a general uh, public. Her texts, just like Oskison's, were... Uh, dispersed in magazines and uh, uh, not easily accessible. And uh, scholars, uh, other scholars than me, I found her fascinating and very interesting. She's, she's a, she was a great uh, person. She was, uh, she was the author of the first Native American opera, uh, the first opera written by a Native American person. She, uh, she also wrote an autobiography. She, um, and she, she, was, uh, she, she wrote many essays, um, uh, activist essays. Uh, if uh, the work had not been done before by other scholars, uh, she would have been my next uh, my next um, uh, subject. I I I I I, I find her very interesting, and and I would have loved to uh, uh, to work on her writings and 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 help uh, people uh, um, access her writings. But that work is done now. You can find her stories, um, uh, um, and uh, and I encourage. Uh, I encourage everybody to to go read her. So she she's a very important uh, uh, person, and there were there were other there were many uh, um, uh, women activists at the time. Not all of them were as prolific as Zit Kalasha uh, or Oskison uh, were, but uh, um, uh, they, they, it's it's always interesting to read them. And actually, my next project, my the next book, I would I would like to to work on. Uh, is a collection of, of different texts uh, by different authors, uh, again, to, uh, to, uh, to contextualize them, to explain them, but also to make them available for a wider audience. That was going to be my next question is what you were working on. So I'm glad you shared that with us. 
Um, we definitely will look forward to to that piece of writing um, when when it is finished. Yeah. You say, you're gonna have to wait for a few years because uh, right now uh, I'm very busy with other other work, and unfortunately I don't have enough time for that. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting topic. Yes, definitely. Um, and we do have your book. Um, Unconquerable here in the Gwinnett County Public Library. So um, for all of our viewers, that is available um, from your bookstore or from here at the library. So we do encourage everyone to get a copy of it and find out a little bit more about the Native Americans here in our, our own country. So Professor Lari, thank you again so much for your time. I know you have a busy schedule and we're so appreciative that you were able to come to us from France and to get just kind of um, whet our appetite for getting a little more about um, th these writings and, and the great research and um, expertise that you've shared with us. So again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I would have loved uh, to come uh, in person uh, uh, to Georgia for, for this uh, this. Uh, uh, meeting, but uh, I'm very glad, uh, of, of course, to, to share this work, uh, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you.